The Rise of Iron After the year of the Taken King, thirst for new content had reached its peak. Players were enjoying the April update, but still didn't know if we would be getting Destiny 2 in 2016 or if it would be delayed. Well, two months later during the PlayStation E3 conference, we would get our answer. Our first look at Rise of Iron told us so much about what to expect. New patrol space, new social space, new enemy type, new raid, and so much more. And on September 20th, 2016, we'd finally get to play the Rise of Iron. And the game itself didn't really change a whole lot with Rise of Iron's update, which was fine because the Taken King and its following updates had the game in a really good state. The majority of changes were to the sandbox, most notably with the weapons. Class abilities, armor, things like that were barely touched. But we got exactly what we wanted, a new full-sized expansion. We received a pretty decent sized campaign with 5 missions, several post-campaign quest lines focused around SIVA as well as the few great new exotic quest missions like the Kvostov quest. We only got one brand new strike which was a bit disappointing but it was a pretty good one and we also had two older strikes come back and SIVA-fied, Sepix Prime being the best revamped strike we've ever got, updated mechanics, updated soundtrack, it was spectacular. And the Fogoth strike was Sivified as the Abomination Heist. Each strike also brought along some new strike specific loot as well. Five new exotic weapons, five new exotic armor pieces, a vendor refresh, new iron banner, and new trials of Osiris weapons and armor sets. World loot pool refreshed with some of the best looking armor and weapons in the game. A triumph book which also contained some incredible armor and weapons, along with a lot of ornaments. The Plaguelands destination that included part of the old Cosmodrome and grew out into a massive quarantine zone full of spliced enemies, lava-filled hellscapes, and SIVA chambers. And some new public events that allowed us to wield Iron Lord axes. And similar to the Taken King's Court of Oryx, we had its equivalent in Rise of Iron with Archon's Forge, another world boss public event zone that had its own unique armor set. Four PvP maps, a new PvP game mode, Supremacy, and of course, a brand new raid, Wrath of the Machine, which had one of the most complex and lengthy exotic quest lines associated with it that required you to learn binary code, all to get the Pulse Rifle Outbreak Prime. Rise of Iron was a treat. The expansion content, while not as large as Taken Kings, was substantial, and the state of the game was the best it's ever been. The tone and atmosphere of Rise of Iron was incredible. The Iron Lords and the story around Siva and Saladin and all that backstory thrown at us was really interesting and just badass. And players were back to being busy trying out all the new things the content had to offer, like the new artifacts. In Taken King, artifacts were just throwaway stat bumps, but in Rise of Iron, they were actual game changers. They would grant you extra grenade and melee charges for the cost of losing your super, or one would turn your enemies into allies when you melee them, and one of them would remove the sprint cooldown on your guardian, and you know damn well that I had that one equipped 24-7. Small secrets and easter eggs were plentiful this time around. The new social space had things like climbing Felwinter Peak or ringing bells in a certain order for an achievement, and plenty of new hidden discoveries all around the Plaguelands with unique rewards. Crucible was in a pretty good state thanks to four new maps and the mode Supremacy which was basically kill confirmed from Call of Duty and on top of that the sandbox shakeup helped keep things a little fresh. The strike playlist was more rewarding than ever and included skeleton keys now that could open up chests for better chances at strike specific loot. The weekly story mission playlist provided some improved rewards as well and the Wrath of the Machine raid was just pure fun. Not as big or complex as King's Fall, but by far the most enjoyable raid to replay in D1. The Zamboni atop the wall was a standout encounter, and Axis was just fun, a lot of movement, and it looked totally badass slamming down on Axis. And the loot found inside of Wrath of the Machine was genuinely top tier. Rise of Iron was a big success, and this year we kind of knew what to expect going forward. We knew there wouldn't be smaller DLCs, just like last year during the Taken King, and that we'd be getting smaller updates and events for the year. First of which was the return of Festival of the Lost. And this year was essentially the same as last year, only this time with some new masks and some fun new cosmetic items to chase down, as well as some more fun interactions this time between the NPCs. One mini quest line involved you trading your box of raisins from last year's event, and making trades between a few of the NPCs would eventually get you one of the best shaders in the game, Super Black. 
Another questline had you tracking down one of the sweeper bot's brooms and searching around the tower until you could find it. And when you did, it actually became a sparrow, which was awesome. But unfortunately, it did expire once the event ended. And this year, there was a whole lot more focus on Eververse, which was disappointing, but expected. Just when you thought Eververse couldn't get any worse, Bungie of course kept pushing the envelope. This year, weapon ornaments were added to the game, and two of them were found in Treasure of the Lost Loot Boxes, as well as some neat ghost shells, a new sparrow, and of course, another very sought after mask. If you paired this mask with the Wolf Howl emote, it would glow blue for a short amount of time. The event was arguably better than last year's with some fun new Easter egg style mini quests, but Eververse was more prominent, so it kind of left a bad taste in players' mouths for the year. But the next bit of content in December was very, very well received, not only because Sparrow Racing made a return, but a new event called the Dawning arrived alongside it. The Destiny 1 Dawning is regarded as Destiny's best ever holiday event that we'd ever received. The event brought a brand new Triumph booklet and that contained Sparrow Racing and Dawning themed items and this year, the booklet was free. It also contained items required to open up presents at the tower. Three of these presents could contain some really great rewards like Treasure of Dawning loot boxes, exotic engrams, and the beginning of a new quest to get the Nova Mortis and the Abaddon exotic machine gun. Treasures of the Dawning, aka the loot boxes this time, were much easier to get without purchasing anything. There were two new armor sets inside of them, a whole bunch of new ornaments, new sparrows, new consumables, sparrow horns, and like I said, it was easy to actually earn these loot boxes that would contain these items rather than having to purchase them with silver. It was clear Bungie listened to the feedback from Festival of the Lost. Sparrow Racing received two more maps to the rotation, totaling to four maps, and received some new quest lines with Amanda Holiday as well. Strike scoring was added to the game, which was huge at the time. New medals and challenges were added with it as well. And Zavala would have new Vanguard Elite bounties like the Sunrise Bounty that could grant you an exotic. Two more strikes were updated and changed. The Tannic Strike became Sivified, and the Nexus Strike basically became a mini Templar fight from the Vault of Glass and required the use of the Relic. These versions of the strikes were fantastic. Icebreaker was updated and brought forward with the update as well. Destiny 1's first and only dawning event would be so successful that many people claimed it was better than the April update, and I'd say they might be right. It did so many things well. It was rewarding, it was cool, and it gave us a lot of fun memories. The game was continually getting the right amount of quality of life improvements, especially to the core game with things like strike scoring. PvP also was in generally a good spot. Events like Trials and Iron Banner were flourishing. Iron Banner especially though, because the changes made to it would make it as close to perfect as you can get. With the inclusion of a better bounty and progression system and some of the seriously fantastic weapons and armor, as well as being hosted at the Iron Temple by Lady Ephrodite, it definitely reached its peak during this year. Now players were expecting Crimson Days to make a return again, however this year Bungie had other plans. Deej would make a statement about having other things cooked up for us that would be taking up the development time instead. Players were a little bit disappointed, but speculation began about what this meant. Was it a smaller DLC like House of Wolves, something like the April update, or something else entirely? Well what we got was the Age of Triumph, which is by far the best update Destiny 1 would ever receive outside of an expansion, of course. Releasing in March 2017, Age of Triumph was the cherry on top of what was already Destiny at its peak. Age of Triumph brought forward the Vault of Glass and Crota's End raids to current levels. It made changes to various encounters, especially in the Crota's End raid. It provided new challenge modes to those raids as well, and things like emblems and ghost shells that didn't exist in them before. Each raid received brand new ornaments to go along with their armor sets, which were by far the best looking armor sets in Destiny history. And each raid would now be part of a weekly featured rotation where all the challenge modes would grant you brand new exotic level primaries that had elements, just like they did in year one. It would also grant you with a brand new armor ornament. But it wasn't just raids that got great changes, it was also things like strikes. Nightfall strikes got the addition of what were called Daybreak Nightfalls, which was basically Mayhem Nightfalls increased recharge rates across the board for your character, and all three elements would be the active burn. And these were just a ton of fun. Also, weekly Nightfall XP buffs were re-included from year one, which would increase XP gains for the entire week, and would make your head have a blue flame around it. The weekly story mission and strike playlist received increased loot drop chances and Treasure of Ages rewards, which were the loot boxes this time around, and they would drop by doing core playlist activities. The Age of Triumph record book was the best record book we'd ever received and brought along so many new rewards for veteran players and collectors. 
and only one negative thing came from the Age of Triumph update, and that was a change to the special ammo economy in PvP. When you respawned, you would have no special ammo and would need to be picked up exclusively through ammo boxes around the map. This wouldn't have been such a bad thing because on paper I think it's a fine idea. However, sidearms could bypass this change because of their intrinsic perk allowing them to respawn with a magazine of ammo, and weapons like Icebreaker and Invective existed which regenerated ammo. If they never made that one change to PvP, I think Destiny 1 would be in a damn near perfect state. And actually despite that change, I think it is in a damn near perfect state. The Age of Triumph was a net positive for the game and is considered the best update for D1. And it was around this time also that Destiny 2 would get announced, and a reveal stream would be happening in two months, May 2017. And man were the hype levels high. How could Bungie screw this up? Destiny 1 is in such a great state. I'm sure Destiny 2 is going to be a masterpiece. Right?